Well, good evening and welcome to Bethel Baptist. And we are excited to see you here. Looking forward to what God has for us in the midweek service. How many of you are coming straight from work, haven't had anything to eat? You're just kind of just, just two wheels. Amen. I'm glad you're here. How many of you had a chance to at least get home and uh, catch a breath before you came? But you had to work today. Amen. I'm glad you're here too. And uh, we won't ask about those that had the day off or have retired or whatnot. We'll just, uh, glad you're here too, but we won't rub it into those. Amen. Uh, I know Wednesday nights are tough, but I love the midweek service. I need the midweek service. Amen. Uh, let's go to the Lord and ask him to help us to be here, not only physically, but in mind and spirit, and that God's will would be done for us tonight. Amen. Wonderful Savior, we do love you. We thank you so much for your goodness. God, I love you tonight. And in recent days, you've reminded me about that love. And uh, God, I just want to say thank you for your goodness, for your mercy. God, I want to thank you for your patience. And tonight, God, we have a desire, and that is to hear from you in a special way. God, I don't, we're not here to impress anybody. We're not here to, to be pomp and circumstance. We're not here for a show. God, tonight, we're, quite frankly, we're here because we're needy. And we need to be better. We need to be challenged. We need to do more for you. And tonight we ask that as your word is open, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would challenge us, that God, you'd encourage us. God, as we lift up our voice and sing these great hymns of the faith, that God, that would point our heart to you so that when your word is preached, we're right where we need to be. God, I pray that none of us would be here and, and quench or grieve the Holy Spirit tonight, but that we would each be empty of self and empty of sin and, and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And God, we're praying for liberty tonight. God, as your, as your preacher tonight, I pray that you'd help me be empty of self. Forgive me of any unconfessed sin and make it, bring it to my mind that I may deal with it in the right way. But God, tonight may I, I, I preach and get out of your way. Help me to not say anything that I shouldn't and help me to say everything that I should. And that you'd be glorified and honored and praised in everything that is said, that is sung and done. We love you and we praise you and we ask these things in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Well, join us in standing. You pray for the Mo family. They're unable to be here tonight. I'm going to lead some in some hymns tonight. Hymn 413. We'll give you a chance to find your place. 413, faith is the victory. Oh, that's our cry tonight. Hymn 413. You lift up your voice as we sing out on hymn 413. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe and veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. And tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame will vanquish all the host. Oh, think about it, church, in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. You may be seated. And God has two announcements for us tonight. Faith is the victory. Oh, what a great time to come in and sing these great hymns. It just helps my heart. Uh, sometimes it's just discouraging. Things are happening. The world and the work week is happening. And just to come in and be refreshed just with a simple song. A couple announcements for us tonight. Uh, some things that I want you to uh, be aware of. First, uh, let me your ears here. I have a letter here. October the 23rd this month. October the 23rd is the 90th birthday of Pastor Lewis E. Holmes. Amen. Uh, of course, 
Uh, most of you, if not all of you, are familiar. Pastor Holmes has been pastor here at Bethel for over 42 years, and God blessed this ministry tremendously under his leadership. And he is a friend of, of this ministry and of this pastor. And uh, in the wake of this pandemic, uh, Mrs. Holmes is recovering from the stroke. Uh, they were going to plan to throw a large birthday party right here at Bethel. That was the plan. All year it's been that. Uh, but because of that, they're not going to be able to do that. They were then going to intend, intend to plan a birthday party for the family, their, their house and the fellowship hall they have in the back room there. And uh, because of some of the recent scares, they're not even going to do that. Brother Holmes is uh, being very precautious about covid understandably with her having a stroke him being 90 years of age and some health issues himself and uh, so what they're wanting to do is if anybody would like to to send a birthday card they're trying to get as many cards to pastor Holmes and uh, you write a little note in there that how much you appreciate him how you're praying for him and mrs. Holmes and that will be such an encouragement I I can just see them now sitting around uh, the their little chairs there in the front the window that looks over at the VA hospital and I can see him open them and then passing them to kitten and kitten reading them and and they'll just they'll just have a good time with that and that'll be encouragement uh, to them and so we have an address here I'm going to announce it now but then I'll have this paper in the back but if you want to write this address down that's okay to do correct okay uh, 1302 East 9th Street 1302 East 9th Street and that's Bonham Texas 75418 75418, 1302 East 9th Street, Bonham, Texas, 75418. If you didn't get that, I will have that uh, on the back uh, this evening, and you can jot that, that down. That will be a great blessing, uh, no doubt about that. I want to let you know that the uh, services for Brother George Sutton uh, have been um, set for Saturday the 24th at 2 o'clock p.m. Uh, that is pretty, pretty set the only thing that if the remains don't make it back for whatever reason, they're, they're, they're scheduled to be well in advance of this. But if they don't, then we will have to make a change. But at this point, uh, everything seems to be on track for Saturday, the 24th at 2 o'clock p.m. Uh, we'll be contacting you, some of our ladies. If you'd be willing to help, we're going to do a dinner for the family. Uh, we'll provide the, the, the Chicken Express, and then we'll have you bring in some sides. And we're going to do that at 1230 uh, for the family there, and they're getting a final number for us there. But I want you to pray about all that's happening uh, and uh, talking with some of you about having a part in that as well. Uh, but do your best to be here that day, Saturday at 2 o'clock on the 24th, and to honor uh, his life. Uh, don't forget, we do have the, the quarter holders that are in the back. Uh, you collect the quarters for every slot. That makes $5. This goes to the Lighthouse Children's Home. Uh, orphanages all over the world benefit from this at Christmas time. Our treasurers want to remind you that you could drop a $5 bill in here, close it, and drop that in. That works just as good. Amen. Uh, a reminder, you could put it in there and then bring it to the offering plate and kind of shake the $5 out and then take it home and fill it up again. Uh, and, and can continue to do that. That always so works. That's just a, something fun to do right now. Uh, get, get the kids in on this. This is something fun for the young people uh, to do some things to earn, to give to missions and help them have a part in that. Then on the back, some of you already saw grabbing them. We have our invitations for Harvest Sunday. And uh, that's November the 1st at 10.30 a.m. It's a combined service. So Sunday school typically starts at 10 and our service starts at 11. We're going to combine that and split the difference. So 10.30 on November the first we'll start our our service right in here there'll be no sunday school but we'll start our service at the conclusion of that we're going to go next door and have a barbecue lunch by blue collar barbecue and we'll have you bring some sides for that as well we're gonna have a sign-up sheet on that on sunday and uh, but i want you to be inviting some folks to be a part of this and uh brother dr dan knickerbocker an evangelist out of fort worth will be our special speaker that day uh, most of you if not all of you know uh, brother knickerbocker he's a friend of this ministry a friend of this pastor and uh, the lord uses him mightily we support him on a monthly basis as part of our missions program his nephew was just here uh, and then uh, we'll be talking about another family member of him tonight uh, as a missionary as well. And so uh, the Knickerbocker family is near and dear to us. So I want you to be in your place that day. Have somebody with you. Again, we're trying to finish this year strong. Amen. And we're going to be talking about some of those things tonight. Uh, so it's a couple of these things. Grab a few of these out. They're blank on the back if you wanted to mail some, if the mail is actually working these days. Uh, but you can also hand these out and let people know to be with you on November the 1st. Of course, they can be with you before and then too. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. But tell them, especially on November 1st, we're going to have a lot of fun with that day as well. And then don't forget this Saturday, this Saturday, God has blessed us tremendously. We're going to have a work day this Saturday at 8 a.m. Friday night going into Saturday, it's going to get down into the 40s. Woohoo! That means Saturday morning, it'll be a little nippy, but you'll start working and you'll get warmed up. But we're not going to be um, killing ourselves in 90 degree heat. The high that late afternoon is, not, is only 74. So it is going to be a beautiful day to get out and work and take care of the property God has given us. Uh, many of you have signed up. We've got some jobs already organized and ready for you. And so I want you to come ready to have a good time. You say, oh, it's work day. We've got to work. But think about the fellowship and the fun that we're going to have. Listen, I don't do anything boring. I think you know that by now. My inner eight-year-old's going to have fun on Saturday, and I want you to have fun too. So you come with a good attitude and ready to do some work, and the Lord will bless that day. Then the 18th, I heard some people talking about it before service tonight about the dessert auction and uh, what they're thinking about bringing and what they're thinking about bidding on. And so I want you to be, have that ready to go. The teens will be working on that some on Saturday as well. And uh, I thank you for your excitement for this. That'll be a blessing to our young people. And it does, the proceeds go to, to benefit them, uh, activities, camps, retreats, and things of this nature. It allows them to do that. And uh, so then don't forget that early voting has started. Anybody already vote? Hey, man, praise the Lord. Good for you folks voting. And uh, if you haven't voted yet, early voting has started. The only early voting in Grapevine is at the wreck right now. Uh, but in the area, uh, I think there's a place in Hearst. Uh, I know the, I think it's in Colleyville. I think the, the city town hall in Colleyville with the library in Colleyville. And then it's Keller that it's the town hall. Uh, or excuse me, South Lake Town Hall. So there's some areas around here that if you don't want to do the rec, you can do early voting. And I'd encourage you to do early voting, get it in, get it taken care of so that an emergency doesn't happen. Plan a day, and if that emergency happens that day, you have a backup, amen? And get your vote. Vote God's word, amen? And uh, I'm excited what God is going to do regardless of who wins the election. My hope and my faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. The heart of the King is in the hand of the Lord, and I praise Him for it. Amen? And so don't forget that is November the 3rd, though, is the actual election day, and we want you to have a, a, a part in that. Then uh, we're going to move our missionary time to the end of the service tonight uh, because it's uh, um, the, the place that, that we're talking about is confidential, and it could be harmful to our missionary. And so we'll turn our live stream off for that portion and be able to just announce that here locally. Uh, but if you had your prayer sheet, I have a couple of things I want to go over with you on that. And uh, you'll see the Missionary of the Week. Again, we're not going to announce that, but that's who we're going to be talking about uh, later this evening. Uh, Brother Mickey has some stats and figures for us and an update from them. Uh, but my family still continues to covet your prayers, and we feel them, and we appreciate your love and support. You notice Miss Jennifer's not here tonight. Uh, her, her intentions were to be here. She's doing fine. She's doing well. Uh, the pain is gone. Uh, what's happened is, as she's feeling better, she's trying to do a few things because she feels like doing some things. And when she does anything, it just wipes her out. Bless her heart, I don't even think she's watching right now. I believe that she's probably, probably sleeping because she did a few things this afternoon. And uh, it just, just takes all of her energy. Uh, that, I mean, that's at least what we're telling the church. I really think she just wanted to finish up the Joel Osteen series on smiling and darkness. But said there was one more, one more sermon series in that and she wanted to finish it. Uh, see, she's not watching, so I can say that. So you don't tell her I said that and we'll be A-OK. -okay. And all God's people said... Hey, a few people won't tell her, good. The rest of you, all right. Uh, no, she is at home and resting, and she'll, she'll catch up. She says thank you, hello, and she loves and misses all of you. But we do praise the Lord for God bringing her through that well. Then we have a praise for Brother Travis. He had a procedure um, this past week on the 12th, and the Lord brought him through that very well also. And we're so, we're so thankful uh, that the, the, um, that went well as well. So I want to put that as a praise. Don't forget to continue to pray for our country, our young people in college, our teens, and our children in school. Our salvation list, and uh, continue to pray for this. We are trying to finish 2020 strong. I mean, Maybe you pick out a name on here that you might want to have an influence on before the end of this year and uh, go after some of these people. I'd encourage you to do that. And then we want to continue to pray for the Sutton family. Uh, Brother Eddie, as of right now, his health is doing well, but there's always a fear that that could flare up 
And we're hoping that doesn't happen before, uh, before the, the service on the 24th, that he could be there. Uh, we mentioned the Holmes family. Uh, Brother Carrier and Mrs. Carrier are doing well. The last I heard, she was still healing. She was trending up, but uh, still was having some problems a couple weeks ago. I'm praying by now that she's back on her feet there. And continue to pray for Susan Springer. Uh, she is continuing her treatments, but they have the wedding uh, next month. And so we're hoping that uh, she'll feel strong and, and able to go to and be involved in all that's happening there. Brother Bill is still traveling and are continuing his treatments and seeing great success. And Miss Karen Hawkins, as we told you, has restarted the chemo. And uh, we want you to ask to continue to pray about all that's happening there. Um, and so then our member needs, we continue to pray for our, our, some of our fellows here that have some continuing health concerns. Good to see Brother Bob tonight. And he's been everlasting out. He grows the small zucchinis that you saw them out there. They're, they're real tiny. They're, they're itty bitty. If he could ever grow a big one, he, you know, some of you hadn't seen them. Some, some of those zucchini he brought were this big, and I'm not exaggerating. And, uh, but it's good to see you tonight, brother. And uh, continue to pray for all that's happening there. Miss Darlene's uh, obviously not here tonight. Continue to pray about some of the health needs that she's having. Of course, our unspoken request tonight, please continue to bring these before the Lord. The Green family that you see there, Shelby and them, they're quarantining. They have not had COVID, but their daughters were exposed to it at their school. And so they have been joining us live stream. Continue to pray for them. As of now, they're not seeing any um, signs or symptoms that they have it, but just in an abundance of caution, uh, they have quarantined, and I appreciate that. Several of you have done that. When you've come into contact, you set out for some services so that you're not bringing it here, uh, and we are, we're thankful for that. Let me just say real quick, um, I know we're kind of pushed for time, but let's be mindful not to get lax, amen? We're reintroducing some things, and we're, that's good, amen? Uh, but we want to continue to be on guard, when you come in the building, be sure to have a mask. If not, we have masks available. You forget your mask? Oh, I understand. Grab one of ours and please wear that. If you bring a visitor with you, if you bring a visitor with you, let them know they're going to be required to wear a mask to come in until they get seated. And once they're seated, they can remove that. If they're not comfortable with that, then just let them know. Then, then let's encourage them to watch online until they're ready to do so. And that will help us out. When we do the next door, we'll have the, we'll have the gloves and we're going to do things safely uh, like we have been doing. Uh, so we're going to kind of have a mixture. We're going to kind of proceed with some things, but we're not going to lose all of our diligence and per being precautious uh, about or being cautious about uh, some of the things that are happening. I just heard of a pastor's fellowship up near where Pastor Holmes is and about, what did you say, 63? 30 to 40 of the pastors left this meeting with COVID, took it back to their churches. So uh, we don't want that. And uh, it could happen. We're, we're obviously at risk. We're doing everything we can to, we still run air purifiers and wipe things down. We have the hand sanitizing. But let's just be sure that we're still doing our best to distance and wearing our mask. And I think we'll be in, in a good position. Then if you will write down the name Josiah Evans, he and Miss Hunyer at home, Josiah is not feeling real well. Uh, just kind of uh, uh, the cold and, and some uh, stomach issues. And, uh, but, and then also pray for the Gail Gilbert family. Gail Gilbert. Uh, several weeks ago we prayed for Brother uh, Mac. His brother went home to be with the Lord. Well, uh, his brother's wife passed away. Uh, and so we're praying that God would bless this family. Gail Gilbert is her daughter from a previous marriage. And, uh, and so we just want to pray for this family. They've really gone through it here in recent days. So I ask you to bless and pray for them. Anyone else that we could put the list before we go to the Lord in prayer? Yes, Miss Molly. Oh, what was his name? Uh, Robert. Um, so we're, we're going to pray for him and his wife. We're going to pray for Robert's health concerns. Wow. Amen. And if I remember correctly, Robert was saved. Praise the Lord. So. Robert's with the Lord, and we are uh, uh, sad to, to see that. And the cancer is a horrible thing, uh, but we know that he is saved and with the Lord and healed, and we praise the Lord for that. Pray for his family, though, his wife, and it sounds like the Lord is already providing for her. That's exciting. Anyone else tonight? Yes, sir, Brother Salem. Six months ago, I shared with God about a, a gentleman I witnessed who was released from New York who came back to church. They had moved. Oh. Wow. Amen. He was moving from the Greenland district down somewhere. Okay. Amen. 
Amen. Sal and has some friends that have been moving here, and uh, they're of the Jewish faith, but they're not going to know a soul except for Sal and. And uh, so maybe they can have an influence and come. And tell them we have a special seat for Jewish. You know, it's just like we have special seats for Catholics or Church Christ or anybody. It's anywhere in here they want to find a seat. It's, it's a special seat reserved for them. Uh, but no, in all seriousness, pray for him that he'd have an influence and uh, finish 2020 strong. This is what it's about. Lord is already working. That's exciting. Anyone else tonight before we go to the Lord in prayer? Yes, sir. Yeah. I will pray for Davy, who likes to yell and cry a lot. Amen. He's already being a good Baptist, making lots of noise. Amen. God bless you, buddy. We'll be praying for Davy, Olden Camp, and all what God is doing in, in his life. Praying that not only Davy, but now um, Judson and Amy and Davy would all come to know the Lord as their Savior as soon as they understand their need. Amen. Anyone else tonight? Wonderful. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Wonderful Savior, we do thank you. We love you for the privilege of prayer tonight. And God, I thank you for the praises. I thank you for what you've done in Jennifer's life and how you've helped her through uh, the surgery. And she's, she's mending, she's trending up. God, I do pray you'd be with her tonight and how you'd restore her strength to her as she desires to do more and to get back involved. Help her not to get uh, too ahead of herself and too ahead of recovery, but that she'd wait on you and you'd bless her. We praise you for Travis coming through his procedure well. And we pray for the Russell family as they're traveling uh, this week and uh, having some time away as a family. And we praise the Lord that they have a chance to do that. I pray you give them traveling mercies, give them a good time of fellowship and bring them home to us safely. Uh, we thank you for what you're doing here at Bethel. Uh, I pray that you continue to bless this ministry. Help us to, to, to see this year out and to finish strong. And God, we can have the influence we've been talking about that we've seen in 1 Timothy and also being the fishers of men that we've looked at in Sunday school. Uh, it is no secret, it is no coincidence that, God, these are the, the overlapping and the theme of the services here in recent days, that, God, you're preparing us for a great work. God, I think of this family that's moving this area, though not, not Christians, uh, but they do have a, have a belief in a, in a faith system. I pray that Salon could have a, an influence and be a friend to them and a witness, and that, God, you'd work in this and make this a, an opportunity uh, to help them uh, see the light of the glorious gospel. God, I thank you for the, uh, the Sutton family family and we thank you how you've ministered and helped them in recent days as the coming of service approaches i pray you'd bless and help them that you'd watch over them and you'd work the logistics of the service out thank you for brother holmes and mrs holmes and how you brought them through some recent scares and day in recent days and uh, we thank you for his birthday that's coming up i pray that he has a good day that mrs holmes and brother holmes would both be strong they'd be alert and that god they would be uh blessed with uh, encouraging words from cards and well wishes from people that love them and that you'd keep them protected and safe from COVID. God, I continue to pray for our missionary family, that God, you continue to use them to make Christ known. God, no doubt they're discouraged in these days with COVID. Maybe they're healthy, maybe they're doing right, but they're so limited and their heart beats to make Christ known. And I pray that you would encourage them, help them to be able to do so where able they're, they're able to, give them favor with their governments and the countries that they're in, and you'd watch over them. Help us to be a blessing in any way that we can, both through prayer and in finances. God, for tonight. I pray you'd be glorified as we look at our reasonable service tonight, that you'd help us in a special way. And we ask these things in Christ's precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Join us in standing. We'll take that hymn book, turn to 442. 442, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able. Do you believe God's able tonight? Oh, come on now. Do you believe God is able tonight? Oh, then lift up your voice. Hymn 442. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed 
and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in Him. But I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Oh, think about the last. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen. You may be seated. Turning your Bibles with me tonight to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter, excuse me, Romans chapter 12. Excuse me. Romans chapter 12. And looking at tonight, uh, two very familiar verses. Uh, sometimes, uh, as a pastor, you, you get hemmed in on thinking, well, I won't preach out of that. The, so many sermons have been preached off of that, and I've preached off of that, and there's nothing really new. But remember, the Bible is quick, and that it's alive, and, and that God's Word never comes back void. And I believe God has something fresh and new for us tonight to make application. As we saw on Sunday night, the application of truth. You can know it. You can hear it, you can be able to share it, but until we apply it to our lives, it's not going to make a difference. So let's make some application tonight. I think that if we were all given the opportunity, if we asked the question, do you love the Lord tonight? We would all give a resounding yes. I mean, obviously that's why we're here. We, we love the Lord. We love God's people. We love the things of the Lord. And, but we say all the time that love is not love until what? It is demonstrated. Put into action. Uh, love it has to be, again, I don't recommend the, uh, the group, the singing group, uh, but there was a, a CCM group, Christian group, uh, when I was growing up called DC Talk, and they had a song called Love is a Verb. Again, I don't recommend the group, but the thought that love is put into action is very appropriate. Love is a verb. We demonstrate our love to the Lord by our service to Him tonight. And our text calls our service reasonable service and when you think about the word reasonable service if you if you think about it you could really look at it at two different ways two different ways to consider reasonable service first of all it is reasonable that god would expect for you and i to serve him that's a reasonable expectation that god would give to us as his children after all he did save us he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because of that, it's reasonable for him to expect us to serve him. But you can also look at this phrase as a reasonable service and understand its meaning this way. God doesn't expect us to serve him in a way that's not achievable. Our service to God is a reasonable expectation. What God is looking from you and I is reasonable. He doesn't give us a goal that's unattainable. He doesn't give us a, a position where it's unreasonable to be able to accomplish. You know, God doesn't say, all right, Brother Mike, you got saved. Now you're responsible for seeing 100,000 men, women, boys, or girls to be in heaven with you. And if you don't reach that goal, then you're not serving God the way you should. Well, man has free will. We, we can't control. Our job is to, to share the gospel and let man make the decision for themselves. It would be unreasonable for God to set a requirement that you will see this many people saved. But it's not an unreasonable expectation to say, Brother Mike, you now take what God has given you and to go in all the world and to share that message. 
It's a reasonable expectation that we should serve him, and the service that he expects of us is a reasonable expectation. You know, sometimes I think we get to looking at the vast and the sheer volume of the need. Have you ever looked at the world, especially in recent days? Have you been watching any of this news coverage on the uh, Supreme Court justice that's being confirmed? And you look at these people, and my first thought was my flesh, and I'm like, Arr, and I get so grumpy. Then my heart breaks. And you look at this and you think there are many people that are cheering them on. And you see the sheer volume, the, the massive need for the gospel. That's just here in America. Then you think about the world and, and, and the, the many false religions and, and how people are given to these things. And when you look at, at the overwhelming need of the gospel, it can get overwhelming. And we think, I, I have so much to do that it's just, what, am I, what, are, what is my little job? What kind of difference is that going to make? And so many Christians just quit and they think, what's the purpose? What's the point? But the problem is we're not called to do the world by ourselves. If I will do what I'm individually responsible for, if I'll do my reasonable service and you'll do your reasonable service and you'll do your reasonable service and the folks that have been blot by the blood of God will all do our reasonable service, it is not extraordinary. It will be accomplished. That's the way God designed it. So, so often Christians are trying to take on more than God ever wanted them to be responsible for. And we, we, we get off track and we think, I'll handle this and I'll do this and I'll take on this because nobody else is doing it, so I'm going to do it. And God never intended for us to do those things. The, the expectation of the Lord is for us to do our reasonable service. We're trying to see 2020 in strong. It's been a unique year. That's probably the most positive word I can say for 2020, has it not? It's been a unique year. But there's been some victories this year. We've seen five people saved through the ministry here at Bethel Baptist. That's exciting. We've reached more people this year than probably any other year because of the live stream. We still have people that faithfully uh, attend our services on a weekly basis. Not necessarily in the service time, Sunday, Sunday, Wednesday, but during the week. Uh, I, I think of, I still get comments from, from other pastors about our children's uh, videos that we did during the lockdown when I was doing the different object lessons and how, how that helped them. I have parents that say, my kids still want to go back and watch those things. So there were some victories this year, we're, but we're trying to finish 2020 strong. And we've been making this, in, this uh, emphasis on influencing others, being fishers of men. We talked about getting a gospel track if you're not normally handing those out and getting just one. And trying to get in front of somebody this week and have an influence. We're talking about, uh, our, again, being the followers of Christ means that we're fishers of men. But that doesn't mean that we're all responsible individually to reach everybody in Grapevine. God has a reasonable expectation for His children. And that's what I want to explore tonight. What is it that God expects of His children? When we read the word here in our text in just a moment, that is our reasonable service. Well, what is that? What is reasonable for us? And then I also want us to see and understand that if we will each take care of our own personal reasonable service, the job as a whole will just automatically take care of itself. Look with me in our text tonight. Again, two very familiar verses, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I believe the Lord can help us. The Bible says, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what that is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, Paul is showing us here that not only is what God's reasonable service is for each of us, but also how we can accomplish it. I have just two points tonight for us. Let's begin tonight with number one, what is our reasonable service? Number one, what is our reasonable service? Look again at the verse one of our text, Romans chapter 12, verse one. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye. This is what he's beseeching. He says that ye. And then the next list what he's beseeching. This next list that he goes through is what our reasonable service is. He begins with number one, our reasonable service is to present our bodies a living sacrifice. 
We are to present our bodies as a living for sacrifice. Now, at first glance, when you hear the word living sacrifice, if you're, if you're like me, you're like, well, that doesn't compute. It's like jumbo shrimp. Ever heard of that? It's called oxymorons. When you take two things that don't go together, but you put them together and they find meaning. Like when I eat shrimp, I like jumbo shrimp. That's my favorite kind of shrimp to have. That means it's the big ones. But shrimp means something small. But jumbo shrimp, there's um, deafening silence. How many of you ever heard deafening silence? That doesn't make any sense. If it's deafening, how is it silent? Uh, or why don't you just act naturally? Well, if I'm acting, I'm not being natural. And if I'm natural, I'm not acting. Those things don't go together. And so we hear God saying that we should be a living sacrifice. When you hear the word sacrifice, it means this. It's an offering made to God as an atonement for sin. It's an offering being made to God. A sacrifice can also be saying any offering made to God in His service as an expression of thanksgiving or homage. It's an offering as an expression of thanksgiving or homage. See, the word sacrifice implies the one who is bringing the sacrifice gives all of it. They give everything that is on the the altar, they're giving it to the Lord. They forfeit their right to it. And when sacrifice to God, the person that's giving the sacrifice is saying, whatever this could have been for me, I'm forfeiting that for you. I'm giving up what I could have done with this. I'm sacrificing this spotless lamb. It could have brought a great uh, a market. It could have brought a great sum of money. I could have uh, killed it and fed my family with it. I could have had a feast with it. I, 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 but I'm forfeiting all those things and letting you have all of it for your glory and for whatever you want to use it with and showing you that I'm placing my trust in you. I'm giving that up in order for it to be the, at the disposal of God that he might use it as he pleases. So the idea that Paul is saying here that is a reasonable expectation of God for you and I to sacrifice our lives for the Lord. Meaning that we forfeit our lives for what we would have done with it. We forfeit the gain that we could have done with our lives. We come to the place where we say, I surrender what I want, what I could have done, what I could have accomplished, and I'm giving that for you, all of me, for you to use, Lord. So that I don't for, uh, profit, so that I don't gain, but rather, God, you use me as you see fit. So that you can profit, so that you can gain. And then it says we're to be living sacrifices, we're not any use to God if we're, if we're not alive, amen? We, we say, well, I'm going to sacrifice myself to the Lord, and I'm going to take my life and give myself to the Lord. Well, that's not of any use to the Lord. He needs us alive. He needs us being willing to, to be that living sacrifice. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 is the definition of a living sacrifice. You see that? We are crucified with Christ. I myself am now dead. I still live. I'm still breathing. I'm still functioning. But what I'm living is not me. I've made the decision to die to self. Josh Town has died. Now I'm living with Christ in me. And I'm living it by the faith of the Son of God because He loved me and He gave Himself for me. So naturally, I want to be a living sacrifice. Now, the easy part is to understand it, is it not? I mean, I'm talking to the Wednesday night crowd. You understand what reasonable service, you know what it means to be a living sacrifice. We've talked about if we, if we brought an animal here and we placed it on a sacrificial altar and we didn't tie it down and we let go, what's going to happen? It gets up and runs away. And we said that's why it's a daily self. Because if we put ourselves as a living sacrifice, we're going to eventually get up. And we, we've talked about all this. The easy part is to understand it. Church, the hard part is to live it. To live it. There are people that I'm looking at right now. You could come preach this message and have a lot more effectiveness than I do because you've, you've lived it better than me. Oh, but church, can we recognize tonight that we have a reasonable service to live out, to demonstrate being a living sacrifice? We know it. We can share it with others. We've memorized it. We've heard it. 
But has application been made? Talked about that Sunday night. We have to apply it for it to make a difference in our lives. You see, the flesh has its own desires. Wouldn't it be nice to get saved and then not have to worry about it? Oh, I got saved, so now I'm going to be everything that God wants me to be. It doesn't work that way. God didn't make us robots. And, and if he did, salvation wouldn't be as, as precious as it is. Salvation is precious because we do have a free will. The Bible tells us in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. See, the idea here of walking in the Spirit is the same idea of being a living sacrifice, which is the same idea as being crucified with Christ. Because we do have the flesh, church. We do have that temptation to get off the altar, to live for self, to promote self, to do what self wants. Oh, that's what the flesh wants. But if we'll walk in the Spirit, we'll surrender to to, to the Lord and say, I'm crucified with Christ. I am forfeiting what I could be I'm forfeiting what I want to be so that I can place all of me in the hands of, the, of God so that he can do with me as what's pleasing to us. So the idea of, is, again, the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, living sacrifice, being crucified with Christ. You say, Pastor, why is there so much Bible? Why is there so much preaching and God's Scripture is devoted to this, this sacrificing of self and death to self? Because the world constantly tells you, be all you want to be. Be all you can be. Do what makes you happy. We're inundated with that from from day one. You you watch even good cartoons and good children's shows. What are they trying to teach our children? Oh, do your best. Make something happen. Do what you want to do. And those are contrary to God's word. We should be teaching our children. No, it's not about what you want in life. What does God want to do through you? Make yourself available for God. Be, don't, don't make plans for yourself. What does God want you to do? How can you make God happy? This is what we need to be teaching our children. Not be all you can be. And I'm not picking on the army. Amen. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an army guy. My dad was army reserves. But we should be saying be all God wants you to be. Be all God can make you to be. Do what God wants you to do. That's why so much of the Bible is geared toward helping us to realign our thinking. Once you get saved, the attitude must be changed. It's not be all you can be, be all what you want to do and what makes you happy. Rather, we need to recognize we have been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6.20 And so many tonight, so many Christians are struggling with their walk. So many Christians are, are battling their, their fellowship and their relationship with the Lord not because of a lack of desire. They want to do right. They want to make Christ happy. They want to be pleasing in His sight. And they want, to, they want to walk with the Lord. It's not about desire. It has nothing to do with the, God's call and the purpose on their life. It comes down to that they're not willing to live a sacrifice life. They're not willing to say, I'm going to die to my desires. I'm going to want what God wants for me more than what I want for self. And both of those things are reasonable expectations for God to expect. It's a task that's attainable to say, I'm going to be a living sacrifice with the Lord's help. Then we see next on Paul's list here in verse 1 of chapter 12 of Romans that we're to be a living sacrifice. Then our reasonable service, Paul says, we are to be holy. We are to be holy. 1 Peter 5, 16, the Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, when you think of the word holy, and when you apply it to God, that means being perfect. He's holy. He's righteous. But when you take this word holy and you apply it to man, it, has, it means a purity of heart, a moral goodness, but not perfect. You know, when you say, I'm trying to be holy, we get in a bad connotation. Well, that guy thinks he's holier than thou. Well, no, we don't try to do that. We're never going to attain that status. We're never going to be perfect. When somebody talks about living a holy life, it's talking about living a pure and moral life. I like to think of it as a painting. Any painters? All right. Think about this. Go back to your childhood. Uh, They had the little things. Uh, usually they came with a, a coloring book and on the side of it was the it was about this long and, and square and it had the little ovals and had the primary colors 
and they looked like wax. And they came with the cheapest tooth, um, paintbrush, had about four uh, pieces of hair there, and you dipped it in the water, right? And then you, you, you ran it over the plastic pieces of, of color, and, and then you painted it on the, on, the, on the coloring book page. How many, you know what I'm talking about? It, it really didn't even barely color the page. It, it just made the paper wet, kind of tinted. You know, I used to watch Bob Ross with my dad. How many of Bob Ross? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I watched Bob Ross with my dad, and then I would get all excited, and I'd go get my paints. And I thought, well, I'll take a little yellow ochre here and some green sienna. And it didn't do the same thing. Why? Because it was barely paint at all. It was just colored wax. But when you paint this, I would get all my supplies out. I would get my coloring page. I'd get all my paints out, and I was excited, and I had this vision of what I was going to paint, and I would get the little cheap paintbrush, and I'd have a glass of water there. And it was, I had to do it outside because you've met my mom and uh, we didn't paint in the house. And uh, so outside and the sun would be hitting that water and it was crystal clear water. It was pure. It was, it wasn't tarnished with anything. And I dipped my brand new paintbrush in there and then I would put it on the red or the green or the yellow or the orange or the blue, orange and blue. I mean, and, uh, and then I would start painting. But when you wanted to switch colors, what did you have to do? You had to clean your brush, didn't you? You had to take that paintbrush and you put it back in the water. And the first time you did that, you got more paint in there than you actually got on the, on the paper. But you looked at that, you could see where the water had been tarnished. And the longer I painted, the more colors that I put on the paper, and the more times I washed my brush and I kept going back and more and back, that crystal clear cup of water that was sparkling, that looked so refreshing, that was pure, what happens? Before long, you look at it and it's this gray mess of imperfection. All the, the grossness of the paint that I no longer wanted was cast off into this cup, Right? It was no longer pure. Church, I want us to see that we start out when we get right with God as that cup of water. Crystal clear, pure, holy. Not perfect, but holy. And with every time we sin, it's like taking that paintbrush, dipping in the paint and painting, and then coming over to our crystal clear life and washing it off. At first, it's just a trail. It's not horrible. Uh, it's not great, but it's not horrible. But the longer we go without being purified, without getting right with God, well, one day you look up after you've swerved, after you've made one little adjustment, after one little adjustment, and you look up, and our life is like that gray, gross, murky water. We're not holy. Therefore, we can't bring our reasonable service to God. God doesn't want your murky, gray water. He deserves the clear, clear crystal water of our life. The term holy also has the connotation of something that is separated to the service of God. See, we can sacrifice ourselves to the Lord, but if we give ourselves to the Lord and we're this cup of gray, tarnished water, what's he going to do with that? Oh, we have to be set apart. We have to be holy. We have to be available for God's use. That's the reasonable service that he expects, that's attainable, and that he is owed. God can't use when we're the gray, dirty water. Then lastly, Paul said our reasonable service is to be acceptable unto God. We're to be a living sacrifice, holy, and then acceptable unto God. You know, when you look at the law, there were certain sacrifices that were acceptable. Certain things uh, and certain classifications and statuses that you've attained, then you had to bring a, a set sacrifice. If you could afford a ram or a lamb, then you would bring that. But if you couldn't, then it was acceptable to bring uh, a pigeon or a dove. But there were certain, if you could afford those things and you brought a dove or a pigeon, then that would not be an acceptable sacrifice. You go with me on here? Well, church, when we're to be an acceptable unto God, this is a warning that we don't do things the way we think we should. We just do what God requires of us. In the Old Testament, the, the Jews, the, the, the children of Israel, they couldn't say, well, the lamb chops on that thing are going to be outrageous. When mama smokes those things for about 14 hours, we put a little, we put a little you know, spices on that, that's going to be good. If we take that to the sacrifice, what a waste that would be. But these doves over here, I'll, I'll bring those. I don't, I don't even like dove meat, kind of dry. I'll, I'll save the lamb chops. 
Does that work? Did that work? Did that atone for sin? And so often we think, well, I'll bring God some service, but I'll just do it my way. I'll do it my way. And God's not looking for your way. He's looking us to be acceptable unto God. Doing it God's way. God is in charge of those things. And we need to be simply need to do, to do what God wants us to do. To please God should be our highest aim. And when we do please Him, it should bring the most reward. You know I love sports, right? Last night, the Tampa Bay Rays are right now in the middle of the American League Division Championship Series. If they win this series, they're going to go play the World Series right here in Arlington, Texas. Woohoo! And uh, they played last night, and they, they had a big inning in the six, and, and they won. I was really happy last night. I was excited. They'll be playing here tonight, a little bit later tonight, and I'm excited for it. But you know what? That pales into comparison. The joy I get when somebody says, hey, my grandson got saved today. Or when little, little Hudson walked up to me and said, Pastor... Can I tell you something? Yeah, buddy, what's up? I just want to tell you I got saved this week. Glory to God! There's no other, there's no other joy to know that we're, we're having some type of influence on the young people here to come alongside this family and to, to, to help water seeds and to see that happen. That's the most exciting thing in the world, to see people come out on grow ministry and go door knocking, to see people come to a, a soul winner's class and say, Pastor, I'm just trying to learn how to do it better, to see people give testimony of going to the gas station and they, they, they get the gas pump going by itself and then they walk over, sometimes with trembling hands with a, with a gospel track and they just tell somebody that Jesus made a difference in their life. This is what excites me. This is the greatest reward that anybody can happen. That is what our aim should be, making and pleasing Christ. That's acceptable to God. Is sports wrong? Absolutely not. But if you get more enjoyment over sports, hunting, crocheting, shopping, whatever, oh, you've missed the boat. That's an unacceptable Life for the Lord. That's not reasonable service. So it's within reason for God to expect these things. We said that Paul wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, obviously. So God said these are the things that we must accomplish to be a reasonable service. So it's reasonable for him to expect it, and they're attainable because God says so. So with my remaining time, and I must hurry, I want to see number two tonight, how to accomplish our reasonable service. How to accomplish our reasonable service. I'll mention very quickly, verse 1 of, verse 12, of chapter 12. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Uh, if you look at this phrase, the mercies of God, that's the motivation. You have to be motivated to accomplish anything. Because God has given you mercy, you should desire to bring reasonable service to Him. If not, then I check your salvation. Make sure you've done what the Lord has done. Make sure you've had that change of heart. Make sure you have that relationship. We won't spend much time on that. But then you go to verse 2. We see exactly how to accomplish the service. Look again at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, And be not conformed to this world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what that is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the first step we see here to accomplish our reasonable service is to be different from the world. We have to be different from the world. You look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord, not saith the pastor, not saith the Baptist, but be ye separate, saith the Lord. You know, it's a sad state today that most Christians, you can't tell the difference between the Christian and, the, and somebody who's worldly. They eat the same, they talk the same, they smell the same, they sound the same, they dress the same, they listen to the same music, they go to the same places, they worship the same there's no difference. We can't be doing a reasonable service and look like what God saved us from. Remember when you were a kid? I, maybe, I'm sure the, your generation, they still did this. They don't do this anymore. But maybe you were having a special dinner. Maybe dad's boss was coming over or maybe a family member hadn't been here in a while and you were going to cook, mom was cooking a dinner. You all set the table. All right, be real careful and put out the What? The good china. You know, the, the, the important people, they didn't get the regular Monday through Friday dishes. Now, they were nice dishes. 
They were. But the imported people, they got the good china. And you set the table, and you had more than one fork. What's this for? Well, I'm serving a salad, and then we're going to have a dessert, and then we have the main meal. How do we have this many forks? Well, we keep this over here in the china cabinet. It's reserved for the special occasions, for the special times. And, and we see here that God wants us to be the special dishes. He deserves the special dishes. I want us to understand the service that we do to the Lord is important. We're to be the special dishes. We're to be separate from the everyday dishes. Not that we're better than anybody else. That's not what I'm talking about. But we're set apart for the special work that God has for us to be. Some of us are trying to do the work that God deserves as a Monday through Friday dish. When God deserves the good china that mom's got put back in the china cabinet. The extra fork that he deserves for his dessert and his salad. I know it's a silly, it's a silly analogy, but go with me on this here. We don't handle ourselves the same way as the world. We don't go to the same places as the world. We don't talk the way the world talks. We don't listen to the music that the world listens to. We don't make Christian music that sounds like the world's music. We're separate we're the reserved China. We, you know, we don't put, what, Monday through Friday dishes? I'll throw those in the dishwasher. Do you, did you put the China in the dishwasher? No. They're hand painted. That'll wash off all the paint. Why? They're different. You don't go to the same places as this world. The China doesn't go to the same place. Monday through Friday dishes went up in the cupboard. All the China went into the China cabinet on display. It had lights in it, and, and the glass, it was, it was pixelated so that the, the lights would, would shine those rainbow colors all over it. It was special. But too many Christians today are getting in the cupboard with the Monday through Friday dishes trying to be served to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Not that we're any better, but we should be set apart for God's use, and it should be special because the work we're doing is important. Then we are to be different than the world. Then to accomplish a reasonable service, we must renew our mind. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things are become new. See, in the, in the Bible, when salvation happens, it talks about a newness, a change. In order to be a living sacrifice, you have to change your thinking. If I hear this one more time, so help me, the Lord's going to have to break me or uh, restrain me. If I have to hear, well, that's not fair. One more time from my little girl. I love her to death. Y'all think she's sweet. And she is. Well, that's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. She has this mindset to think, well, that, that everything should be fair. It has to be fair. Oh, I'm trying to teach her. You. You're going to have to change your mind about that. And so many Christians think, well, it's not fair that I don't get to go to those places. It's not fair that I don't get to participate in that those activities. It's not fair that I can't have my hair that way or I can't dress this way or I can't go to those places. Oh, it's time to renew our minds, Christians. God is not, we're not missing out. Oh, we're encountering a different life that's above and beyond what we can ask or think. It's a renewing and changing of our mind. A living sacrifice is not looking for what is fair. It's not looking for what is best for me. It's looking for what is best for God in me. That's an unnatural thought, though. But we have to change our mind. It requires a renewing the mind, a change in mind. Instead of trying to satisfy my wants, self-seeking, and to satisfy what I need, we want to change our mind to say, God, what do you need? What pleases you? What helps you? What furthers your cause? Well, church, we're never going to demonstrate our reasonable service until we renew our mind. Then lastly, to accomplish our reasonable service, you must follow the will of God. God's will. And guess what? God's will may differ from your will greatly. And when that happens, don't fear, get excited. Now that's good preaching, and that's a good place to say amen, but that is the hardest thing in the world to live. When God's will differs from yours, it should be something we should get excited about going, whoo God's about to do something great, and he's going to show me great and wonderful things. But what do we do? Excuse me, what do I do? Master, carest thou not that I perish? Oh, 
we've got to renew our mind and say, what is God's will? Have the mindset that Christ had in the garden of Luke 2.42. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. When you're living in sacrifice, your will no longer matters. It simply means pleasing God and performing His will. In closing tonight, I believe everyone wants to demonstrate reasonable service to the Lord. I believe everyone here would say that it's reasonable for God to expect these things. But I believe more than a few of us would say tonight that it's difficult to attain what God reasonably expects from us. Can it help us to understand tonight the only reason that our reasonable service is not attainable, the only reason that it's not attainable is because we're not ready and willing to be different from the world, we're not ready and willing to renew our mind, and we're not ready and willing to surrender to the will of God. Those three things are the key that unlocks the door of attaining our reasonable service from God. Simply renewing our, our, being different from the world, renewing our mind, and surrendering to the will of God. If you'll do those three things, then you will accomplish your reasonable service for you. And together, individually coming together, we'll accomplish what God wants us to do. As a ministry, as a Christian church, uh, singular, this body of believers, also as the church of the Lord worldwide. Unfortunately, we want to serve God in our own way. Give God half, or sometimes we think we're real spiritual when we say we'll do a 70-30 or an 80-20 split. But when God came and sent Jesus to die, he didn't give us 70, half, or 80% of him. He gave him. He gave all of his life. And he gave his life that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I wonder tonight, is your life acceptable to God? Is your service, is your reasonable service acceptable to God? If you were to, 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 to rate it on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you be? And then as you rate that, I wonder tonight, are you using God's scale? God's standard or your standard? Oh, church, may we give God our reasonable service. It's attainable and it's reasonable that he would expect it from us. Would you pray with me tonight? Wonderful Savior, I thank you for your goodness and for your help tonight. God, I love you. And God, there's areas in this that I have just failed. There's no doubt about it. God, forgive me. So encouraged in recent days to know that you understand we fail you're patient with us. I pray tonight if someone's here tonight that you've put your finger on some things in their life, they wouldn't get bogged down, they wouldn't get brokenhearted and, and, and moan and, 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 and get down over it, but rather they would get it right. They'd recognize your forgiveness and they would just attempt to do better. They would get back at doing the work that you've called them to do, to do their reasonable service and to demonstrate it. And because of that, you'll receive the glory and honor and the lives will be changed. Not only theirs, but the people they'll have an effect on. Would you speak with us in this invitation time? With every head bowed and every eye closed, please, no one looking around. I wonder, might you be here tonight? And as you consider your reasonable service, the Lord spoke into your heart about it. Maybe it's in the area of being separate from this world. If you were being really honest, your life's not much different from this world. The Lord's spoken to you that you're never going to accomplish your reasonable service without some separation. For another tonight, maybe you're here and the Lord has spoken to you about your purity or living holy. Remember, when applied to men, that doesn't mean perfect, but living a life attempting to remain pure in all areas. Maybe the Lord is showing you some things in your life that would be different from that. And lastly tonight, maybe you're here tonight and you're trying to do your reasonable service your way. Not the Lord's way, but your way. You're trying to be that sacrifice that's not acceptable to the Lord. The Lord's calling on you tonight to simply do it His way. I pray that if the Lord has spoken to you, you will respond tonight and do business with the Lord. As she plays, join me in standing. The altar is open. The Lord's spoken to your heart. You come forward and spend some time doing business with the Lord tonight.